Hello, my name is James Howe. I am the Program and Communications Manager with BEP Waterloo Region. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Before we get to our main program, um, I have just a few introductory remarks. Um, BEP Waterloo Region is a local charity that helps make everyday career day for youth in Waterloo Region, particularly those in grades 7 to 12, um, in a variety of ways, including our Speakers Bureau and uh, events such as our Explore Your Future series, um, which is uh, what we're doing here tonight. Before we uh, move forward, we would like to um, acknowledge that we are broadcasting from the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, the Anishinaabe, and neutral people. We honor and respect the First Peoples of Canada and strive to learn from their example. We also wish to thank the sponsors who have made this series possible, um, in particular our lead sponsor, Toyota Motor Manufacturing of Canada, um, and our other sponsors, which are Nova Canada, the region of Waterloo, the Workforce Planning Board of Waterloo, Wellington, and Dufferin, and the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Programs of both the Waterloo Region and Waterloo Catholic District School Boards. The goal of our Explore Your Future series is to help young people like you in Waterloo Region and your families to better understand the career opportunities available to you and ways that you can continue to explore and prepare. Tonight's session features four people with uh, careers in business. In fact, they all own their own business at, at various different stages. Um, they'll start by sharing what they do and how they got to where they are. We are uh, ready to uh, get started. Um, if I could ask our panel to join me on screen. Okay, so um, with us here tonight is, and, and this is the order which they'll speak. First off is Courtney Castle. She's a digital marketing consultant um, who owns her own uh, digital consultant, marketing consulting firm. <laughs> um, we have Tyler McIntyre. He's a certified personal trainer um, who's running his own business uh, doing that. We have Ajoa Minta. Um, she is both the founder and CEO of uh, For All Ice Cream. And we also have Pandora Wilhelm, who is the owner of Mulberry Design and Engravings. So thank you all for coming. Uh, welcome. Uh, we look forward to your um, words of interest and advice. I. Uh, um, actually owned my own, own uh, business for a while doing uh, communication for non-profits primarily um, back in the day when uh, social media especially was um, becoming very big. So I, I, uh, I, I know that, uh, um, you know, just even to be in business itself uh, um, it, it is a big deal um, and the stay in business is an even uh, greater success um, and that there are ups and downs, and I'm sure we'll, we'll get uh, some of that this evening. So. Uh, and so if I chime in, it may be partly from personal experience. So we, we're uh, here to hear what you have to say. So um, let's get started. We'll uh, welcome each of you. We'll have five minutes uh, for opening remarks, basically to share about uh, your career story from high school until now uh, in as much detail as you want. Um, um, and then uh, once you're all finished, we'll take questions from the participants. Well, Courtney, please. All right, thanks very much for that introduction and uh, very happy to be here with you all this evening. Um, really love doing these talks. I've um, been doing it for several years now and I'm a, a Waterloo Region native myself. I went to St. David's and Laurier and Conestoga, not quite yet University of Waterloo, but maybe one day I'll do the whole trifecta. Um, but yeah, thanks very much for having us. Um, 
yeah, a bit about uh, my journey. It was definitely the definition of not a straight line, which is probably going to be a bit of a theme this evening. Um, I started out in high school uh, really loving English. Um, I was always uh, very much um, into all anything, the arts and creative, like any sort of creative industry element like that. Um, communications and creativity were always my strength. So I was very much pushed into um, those kinds of classes and loved creative writing. And um, I found I really didn't explore too much about kind of the practical outlets for that. And always assumed I might just be like a, a fiction writer or something like that, um, you know, which is probably one of the big regrets I have now is that I didn't push outside of what I wasn't best at. Like I knew, you know, I was a bit of a teacher's pet in English class. I knew that's what I was good at. But if I had kind of tested the waters in business a little more or in tech a little more, perhaps I would have realized my love of digital marketing a little sooner. So um, yeah, but it has obviously helped me um, in my career as a digital marketer. I started as, um, as a copywriter. So, you know, no regrets there. But um, out of school, I went to uh, Laurier for English Literature. Um, I went there for two years and I really enjoyed it um, at first, but um, then I ended up having to leave because I had issues with depression and it was, just, um, it was just too much for me to go to school. And this was in a time when there was really wasn't like Bell Let's Talk Day and all the uh, visibility that there is now into mental health. Um, problems like depression and anxiety, etc. Um, so it was a real struggle for someone who was definitely very ambitious and a straight A student who was like, not familiar with this kind of a failure at all. So probably one of the most difficult challenges in my life to date was having to drop out and just come to terms with the fact that um, that I had depression and that I could be a successful person with it. So um, it took about two years or so going to cognitive behavioral therapy and just kind of finding myself um, a bit of uh, lost years, like just, you know, working through all of that. It's a lot um, when you're younger and there's just a lot of things going on and other people in my life were um, getting their masters and doing other things. So it's just difficult to try not to compare yourself. But um, after I kind of uh, went to CBT, which is cognitive behavioral therapy, for those who don't know, um, that really helped me learn how to manage my depression. Um, and I decided, you know, you know, you're great at writing. Why don't you channel that into going back to school to Conestoga College? So I went to the advertising and marketing program there. Um, it's a two year program. And I thought, um, I'll get the credentials I need. Um, I feel like it's a creative industry that I might do well in. And from day one, I just I absolutely loved it and I never looked back. Um, so I uh, did very well there and then got a job out of my internship at a local agency called Honey Pot Marketing and um, basically worked my fingers to the bone for three years or so as their intern doing everything under the sun for them and ended up becoming their director of marketing. So um, it was definitely, um, once I found marketing, it was a rocket ship in terms of my career from knowing nothing to um, having a team of 15 people reporting to me in a five year span or so. So that was interesting and really such a valuable experience. Um, and I just decided that I, you know, being a bit of a control freak and a bit of a, um, you know, just wanting to kind of control things and make the business decisions myself, um, I decided why not do that, what I do at the agency, but just as a one woman team. So that's what I do now for Castle Consulting. Um, I work directly with business owners to do anything from grow their social media channels, to build their websites, to run their advertising campaigns. Um, basically a full stack digital marketer is what it's called. And uh, yeah, in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's kind of my journey. And like I said, not straightforward at all, but I don't really, you know, I needed every step to get to where I am. So, yeah. hey, great. Thank you very much, Courtney. Um, next, we'll have, uh, I think it's Tyler. Awesome. Uh, thank you all for joining us and thank you everyone, uh, you know, for the opportunity. Um, so a lot of similarities. I, I love that, you know, Courtney had said like not a straight line. Um, uh, mental health definitely played a big part into why I do what I do as well. So out of high school, um, I went to Conestoga for journalism, um, kind of similar to Courtney, always loved writing. It was like English and the arts and literature and stuff like that. Um, 
actually never took any of the uh, more advanced like science courses, which is something I'm absolutely obsessed with right now. I love biology and anatomy and kinesiology and stuff like that. So that's, if I did have a, a small regret from high school, it's that I never took any of those classes. Um, but I actually uh, dropped out of college uh, pretty quickly. I was uh, extremely bored and, and not challenged. Um, and that's something I actually had trouble saying for a while that I dropped out of college, but it's something um, that it was a stepping stone to help get me where I am. And I don't think, uh, you know, I would be an entrepreneur and working for myself if I kind of uh, kept kept uh, down, down that path. Um, and then in terms of really how I kind of found uh, my calling as a health coach and a personal trainer, um, in my late teens and early 20s, I started experiencing pretty severe social anxiety and depression. Uh, it seemingly came out of nowhere from my perspective. Um, public speaking and, and, and kind of being the class clown and center of attention and stuff like that was always something I loved to do. And I always thought it was kind of weird that I developed an anxiety um, surrounding what was always one of my favorite things. Um, looking back now, I definitely see that I wasn't treating my body right in terms of how I was eating, you know, late teens, you're, you know, can legally drink alcohol and stuff like that. And just, you know, not sleeping well, and not eating well and all that type of stuff. And it just kind of snowballed, um, began to seek, uh, help through the kind of conventional routes. Um, again, I love that Courtney brought up CBT because that was extremely helpful for me as well. Um, that actually, uh, I would say personally, probably the most helpful thing. Um, and in the past couple of years, I've been uh, absolutely obsessed with Stoic, ancient Stoic philosophy, which is uh, what CBT is actually based off of. And I continue to utilize lessons uh, learned from that every day. Um, and also use what I've learned to uh, help coach people. Um, so as a personal trainer, yes, my day-to-day -day is, you know, counting the reps, coaching the form, creating workout programs, discussing nutrition, all that type of stuff. But, but I, I kind of use it as a vehicle to, I mean, I've had so many different conversations about, you know, relation, the relationship problems, uh, work issues, daily stresses. You know, sometimes people come in ready to work out and we're just, we end up doing a few sets and just end up chatting, you know, I've had people crying and all that type of stuff. And it's, uh, it's really, uh, really, really fulfilling. Um, but basically what kind of helped me, uh, with my anxiety and depression was eating well, exercising, nothing crazy, you know, just some push-ups and sit-ups in my room, just eating a little bit better, you know, taking a couple vitamins, going outside for a walk, all those kind of small steps. Um, I just like to get across that, like people, think that changing their health is doing a complete 180 and tearing out all the crappy foods and going to gym five days a week. And it's not that in my experience, that does not work. It really is about taking small steps in the right direction. Um, so yeah, day-to-day -day personal training, um, definitely some, you know, growing my social media and, you know, blogs and stuff like that. I just kind of want to make a uh, kind of as, as big of a global impact and help uh, uh, positive, positively influence as many people as possible. The last thing I'll just quickly say um, is that I think, youth today are under such extreme pressure to have everything figured out in terms of life, let alone their careers. And I, I, again, could not have projected that this is like even five years ago, that this is what I was going to do. Um, I've done a whole bunch of different jobs, a lot of construction work, like carpentry, all that stuff. Um, and it was just kind of stepping stones to get me where I am today. So I just want to say, like, please do not feel the pressure of it all figured out. Like you have the time do some exploration, um, figure out what's kind of right for you. And ultimately, um, I'm a big fan of uh, the best entrepreneur in the world, potentially Gary Vaynerchuk, when he says happiness has to be the North Star, you have to be happy and fulfilled with what you do. That is, I think, ultimately the most important thing. And I just, and that's where I'll leave it for right now. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Tyler. Um, our next panelist is Ajoa Minta. Everybody, thank you so much for having us today. Um, I'd say similar to Courtney and Tyler, definitely not a straight path where I am today. And basically where I am today is that I'm the founder and CEO of For All Ice Cream. And we make, we make ice cream, um, as, as simple as that. Um, kind of thinking back to high school, I don't think that I would have, I don't, for sure, that I had no idea that this is kind of where I would have ended up. I didn't even know that it was a possibility, not something I imagined. Um, in high school, I loved art. I loved art and music. I was a band nerd. I, you know, was into, I was also into art, like art was my favorite class and so was music. But 
I also grew up in a household, or rather I grew up in a household where I had immigrant parents who would, you know, sacrifice a lot to come to Canada to give me better opportunities. So the thought of going into art, just like it wasn't, as much as I loved art, it wasn't a conversation that we, that, that was, that was, um, that we, that we ever had. I'm also going to say that luckily for me though, I had an aptitude for math and science. It wasn't, I, I found it interesting enough. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't, it's not that it wasn't hard, but I understood it. And I was like, okay, I, I can do math and I can do science. And so, you know, come to grade 11, come to grade 12. And I'm going to age myself a bit. When I went to high school, there was a grade 13 as well. Um, coming to those years where I had to make a decision, it was, you have to decide what you're going to do for the rest of your life. I was like, hold, hold on. I don't, I don't know what that's going to be. So I kind of looked at the options ahead of me and for me, what I decided to go into university for um, was engineering. And a lot of people think, oh, wow, like you must love, you know, you must love all things technical. But for me, as I kind of looked at what I could get into, what I realized is that I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I picked a degree that would keep me flexible. I could decide later. Um, and because I was able to, again, because I had the aptitude for math and science and I liked it enough to pursue it. I was like, well, this is, I'm going to make the decision later, but I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go into engineering because I don't yeah. really have to know what I want to do. And hopefully by the time I'm done, I'll, I'll have a better idea. I specifically picked the University of Waterloo because they had a co-op program. So that was going to let me try out jobs um, while going to school. I would say that what I learned most out of all my co-op jobs is that I hated every single job that I that I tried. Right? It was none none of them were for me. None of them were right. Um, you know, so I I finished I finished my degree and I ended up in I ended up in automotive. I ended up in product development. Very technical, but what I loved about that role was that it was product design. It was very, it was actually very creative. Um, you know, my job was to, I worked with, I worked with designers, they designed vehicles and my job was to figure out how do I make what they designed work. They, you know, they, they've drawn a picture. Now I get to look at the picture and, and interpret how does, how does this do, do the thing that they want it to do? And then I would get to design something back to them to say, okay, I think I understand what you want this to do. If, if it, it's designed this way, you know, my company can make it and, and this will work the way you want it to. So I, I love that kind of creative exploration a lot. I did that job for a while and then it was, you know, it came to a point where it's time to move on. And I actually went into technical consulting and I ended up, I mean, of all places, I ended up actually at a, at a, at a finance company. And, but I was, I was basically heading up their technical department. They had a specific tax credit that people could qualify for. But um, what accountants realized was that it was a technical tax credit and it was easier if engineers spoke to engineers. So again, it, it was kind of a, it was a different path and nothing that I expected to get into. But again, what I realized that I loved about that was that I loved being, um, you know, with my clients and listening about, listening to their technical problems. But then the job is really to interpret in a way that other people could understand, that non-technical non, non people could understand. So I love the communication aspect. I love the interpretation of something, you know, super technical and super jargony, jargony and, you know, making it something that people could relate to. And so I feel like, Along the way, what I was picking up were, you know, were, were things that I liked doing. So university taught me what I didn't want to do was a job. I had a first job where I loved the creative aspect. I had a second job where I loved, um, you know, the communication aspect. In the meantime, in this job, I, I'm, I'm somebody that, like, when I do something, I do something all in. I'm a 100% focused on it. And I give everything my all. And people around me were like, wow, you're working so hard for this company. And my husband one day said to me, you are working so hard for this company as if you own it. And what he meant was stop working so hard. You're stressing yourself out. What I heard was if I'm going to work this hard, I might as well own it. That's like that. That was that was to me. That's again, that's not what he meant to me to hear. But that's what I heard. And so, I mean, working as hard as I was working, I, I would say that I probably just burnt myself out. Um, so I took a leap of absence. I was like, I got into a point where I'm like, I, I don't want to work this hard in this environment, or rather, I, I like working this hard, but, but what, what am I getting out of it? So I was fortunate enough to take a break and figure out what I wanted to do. 
And that's where the idea for all came from for me. I knew that, you know, there was aspects of engineering that I loved. I love the creativity. I love the problem solving. And I like the communication aspect of it. Um, I loved eating ice cream. Who doesn't? And for me, I was like, well, how do I, how do I make some, you know, how do I create something that I love, right? I don't despise being an engineer, but I want to do it in, in my own, in my own way. I love this area that I live in. I'm now living in Waterloo. Um, and, you know, so it was just, again, it was a way to be, to be creative. And one of the things about me is that I love kind of out, out, I guess, out their ideas. And so I was like, well, who's doing ice cream in this area? And the answer was nobody. So I was like, well, how about I do it? And again, I had no idea how to do it, but it was just an idea that I was like, this, this is what I need. And this is what I think this community can, can, can use it and use as well. So I basically made it my mission that I was going to start an ice cream company with no idea how to do it. But my goal for myself every single day was that I was every day I was going to learn more and I was going to take a step towards achieving this goal. And I was going to stop only if there was no more steps for me to take. And it was it was fun. It was a challenge when I'd wake up and I, you know, I had an opportunity to go to Ice Cream University. It turns out that there's Ice Cream University at the University of Guelph. So I enrolled and I went and said, OK, now I know how to, to do this. Um, you know, I looked up the rules and the regulations on how to do it. So every day for me was a step where I didn't really know where I was going to end up, but it was great to, to, to wake up with that vision in mind and knowing that for me, that it wasn't super important whether I achieved it or not. It was just more important that I tried. And I guess, you know, long story short, that's really how and why I'm here today is that I was able to, you know, wake up every day and just try and take that step. Now, that, then that was the goal I made for myself was that, you know, here's my idea and my goal in any given moment was just to, to, to wake up and try and make that step forward. And so I'm, 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 I'm still moving, I'm still moving forward. Um, before we move on to our final panelists, I'd like to uh, encourage everyone, if you have questions, um, we're just kind of uh, getting a, kind of the top level of what people are um, uh, their experiences are, um, especially in terms of owning a business. So if you have any questions, um, you know, just type them in the Q&A box and uh, we will pull some of those out and we will be starting to answer them soon. Um, but first we want to hear from Pandora Wilhelm and uh, about her business. Hi, um, my name is Pandora. I'm the owner of Mulberry Design and Engraving and I'm Métis from the Georgian Bay area of Ontario. Um, I moved to Kitchener-Waterloo back in 2012. Um, started at Conestoga College in January 2013 for general arts and sciences because um, I wasn't really sure what I wanted to do. My first job was as a dishwasher at a restaurant near our cottage. Um, I still work there in the summers almost 20 years later um, when they need extra help even though it's changed hands a few times. I still have a really good relationship with the owners. Um, and it's, it's just something that I've always done. I still work in hospitality as a waitress part-time as well. It's something that I've just never quite been able to give up. I love chatting with people and meeting new people, especially in our region in the summer. Um, we get a lot of tourists in the area I live in. I live in Linwood, um, which is kind of in the heart of the Mennonite country in our area. So yeah. Um, so yeah, my first job was as a dishwasher. And then I worked at Tim Hortons. I worked a lot of, you know, the typical little student job that many of you probably work or at least some of you I know there's probably at least one of you here who's worked the Tim Hortons drive through or the McDonald's drive through close to your home um, and those are all like great first job opportunities when you're there and you might not necessarily be enjoying your job or enjoying your life but you're going to learn things that in 10 years from now you're going to look back on and be like oh my gosh like that was something I learned as a skill when I was 14 working the drive through at a 3 to 11 shift or something I learned while I was washing dishes at 16 as a dishwasher in the back of house of a restaurant. So all of those jobs that you're working now through your secondary school and into post-secondary, those are skills that you're going to learn that's gonna take you to where you are. And I honestly have so much thankfulness for the jobs that I have worked because at the time they may have seemed menial and not necessarily fun, but all of those skills I've gained over the years and these jobs that at the time I hated um, is what made it to made me be able to start the business that we've started today. Um, so recently I'm in my thirties. I went back to school for early childhood education 
Um, that's now becoming a very popular career. I notice a lot of secondary schools are pushing UCE and post-secondary schools are offering new tuition um, discounts and stuff like that for people to go back into school for early childhood education because of the shift Ontario is making towards inclusive child care for families. Um, so I started back at school. Um, I didn't go locally. I went to an Indigenous specific school called First Nations Technical Institute. Um, it's an Indigenous post-secondary institution that works in partnership with Canador College and some other universities and colleges, depending on the program. And it's on Tyendinaga First Nations, which is up by Belleville. Um, when I was in school, um, when I had started, one of the projects that we had was to create an early learning resource for our classroom that reflected our culture and our community. Um, so I had made this like little paper matching game and did my presentation. And then when I got home, I was chatting with my husband about it. And I was like, oh, like this would be cool. You have a graphic design background. Maybe you could help me make a couple matching games and we can see how they go. Um, my husband works in the woodworking industry and in lumber. And uh, he was like, well, why don't you look at maybe getting a laser engraver? Why don't you see about making tactile resources that have renewable resources instead of, you know, laminated paper with printer ink? And that's kind of how our business was born. So the first product we made was an Indigenous matching game where we match the animal with the animal tracks. And at the top of the tile, it's got the Indigenous language. And on the bottom of the tile, it's got English. Um, and we started that. I've got one here. I don't know if you can really see it, but it's just kind of super simple, made out of maple, um, engraved and sanded. We don't finish them, we leave it natural, um, trying to stick to as natural as possible without using any types of solvents and stuff like that. Um, and yeah, it's kind of just built from there. We do mainstream laser cutting and engraving. And when I mean mainstream, I mean like we make cutting boards for organizations. Um, we engrave toboggans, we engrave wagons, we engrave barbecue scrapers, just anything that somebody would want engraved that's out of wood is something that we do as well. But our focus is on um, the Indigenous side of things, like the Indigenous early learning resources and um, resources for early learning classrooms. Um, I would say like the biggest lesson I've learned in starting my own business is that it's not a linear journey, like everyone said, but when you're your own boss, you need to be accountable to yourself. Um, in high school, I was a good student. Um, I loved music. I actually wanted to go to school to be a music teacher. I got pregnant in grade 12 and dropped out and went back when my son was about two years old to get my grade 12 and then moved down here and, and started kind of fresh down here in the Waterloo region. Um, so yeah, like it, it's, I'm not where I thought I was gonna be. I'm still working in education, but I'm not necessarily where I had thought I was gonna be when I was 15, 16, 17, um, starting my own business, but again, all of the experiences from then until now has really helped show me how to run my own business. Um, I worked shipping and receiving for a local business who uh, sold fair care products and learned how to ship and receive and how to ship and where to order shipping materials and how to use Canada Post and Purolator and all of those types of things. And at the time I was like, oh my gosh, this is awful. I'm in this basement packaging stuff every day. And then now as soon as we started shipping things, I knew where to order my supplies. I knew how to do it. I reached out to them and asked for advice. So yeah, that's, sorry, that's pretty much my story. My husband and my daughter just burst it into my store with my dinner. So I'm gonna mute myself and turn it over to any questions or answers or anything like that there. Thank you very much. Um, we have, uh, well, we're up to three questions now. Um, I, I know that we have two very good questions that I've already seen. Um, uh, first question I'll ask is um, from Saba, I believe. Uh, how was it for you when you were just very just starting your business? Um, and uh, did you consult with anybody who had experience? And I, and I think that's um, something that's interesting and important about tonight's panel is uh, last year we had a similar session with people owning businesses, but they were um, mostly uh, larger and more established. So um, uh, we have some more younger businesses or smaller businesses. So how did, uh, yeah, um, how was it when you were very just getting started and, uh, and where did you get any advice? Maybe I can start. Um, for me, there there are some great resources in this area, and I feel like probably in other communities as well. So I had approached the Small Business Center because I didn't know anything about starting a business. 
except for I wanted to start a business. And so they provided some really, um, you know, some there, there's some like courses you could take with them, like some information sessions you could take with them. And what was also very helpful for me is that they were good at connecting me to, to experts, right? Like I knew that accounting was probably something that needed to happen, but I didn't know where to get an accountant from or what they do. So the Small Business Center, again, they gave me a bit of an education on things that would be a good idea to do, but they also connected me to an accountant. Um, similarly, you know, there's legal things that you have to do. I don't know what these are, but um, the Small Business Center was able to give me, again, an overview of, you know, some things that you might need. And I was also able to be connected to um, like a, a business lawyer. So for me, that was a, a good first place to start because I, you know, I figured out how to make ice cream, but, but, you know, that's not a business right there. There's other things. So really it was just seeking out the resources that I could see um, to, to, to a learn, learn things. Like, it's almost like you need to learn what you don't know. You don't need to be an expert at it, but you need to have a bit of an idea of what, what do I know and what don't I know? So I, I found that the Small Business Center was a good place for me to start. And one of the most important things is that I'm, in, I'm incorporated. And like that, again, it was kind of understanding, you know, should I be, should I not be? They're able to help me out to, to do that piece as, as well. So yeah, that, that's, that's my response. <laughs> Um, I'll just maybe jump in and just say that there's, yes, uh, access all the resources. Like, I think we are in the age of entrepreneurship, like with just social media alone, like we are at an extreme advantage versus 10, 20 years ago. So definitely take advantage of that. Take advantage of like the small business center and stuff like that. Um, definitely having like, I think mentors uh, in whatever industry uh, that you want to kind of get into is really, really important. Um, and just like, if there's people you follow, like on Instagram and stuff like that, or on social media, just like reach out and ask questions. I think that's the thing I want to get across is that like the question was, you know, how was it for you when you were just starting? Uh, I made a lot of mistakes. I learned a lot and I'm a big believer. Like one of my favorite quotes is by Nelson Mandela. I never lose. I either win or I learn. And from kind of all our introductions, I think some of the similarities that I noticed is that like a lot, we pretty much all ended up in places that we didn't initially expect. And then there were bumps along the road and stuff like that. And like, those things are going to happen. It's not going to be smooth sailing. Um, and I'm not saying that in a discouraging manner, but like, that's, uh, you know, one of the, you know, the, C the CBT techniques is like being prepared for those eventualities. Um, just understand that you are going to make mistakes and that's completely okay. Um, and yeah, just ask questions, just ask questions, I think is important. Um, for me, I accessed um, the, as soon as I kind of knew that I wanted to start a business, I connected them with the Laurier Entrepreneurship Center, um, or the Women's Entrepreneurship Center, sorry, at Laurier. So if you're female identifying in the community, um, they have a lot of like really amazing workshops and programs. Um, mine was like a 16 week course, two nights a week, where we got to learn from experts in different fields. So we were learning a bit about everything on how to start our own business from basic accounting to bookkeeping, to how to make a website. And then they provided tools and resources, whether it was connecting you to a mentor within a post-secondary setting or somebody that had graduated through, like graduated through one of their business programs. Um, so that's kind of where I started when it, when I realized I wanted to start my own business. That was the first step that I took into figuring that out. Nice. Yeah, there are, everyone's mentioning some really great local programs that um, I've heard of that are really great resources. Um, when I, about three years ago, when I decided to dive in and start my company, I did consult with people. Um, I consulted with my former boss of a um, local agency, respected a lot and told me, don't do it. There's too many freelancers and consultants as there is. Uh, other people in my support system told me, do it as like a side hustle for a while and build it up. But I, like I had the fire and I would describe myself as fiercely independent. Um, and I just said, like, I know I want to do this. And so I just opened a Google document in the drive and just, you know, went from there. So um, I definitely didn't have like a business background, but I felt I did definitely have a leg up having such a marketing background um, and helping like work directly with so many business owners. So I had a bit of knowledge, but I've definitely the last three years been filling in a lot of the gaps, um, like especially anything to do with taxes and finance, because I am not a numbers person, um, unless it's an analytics report from Instagram. 
So <laughs> yeah, it's scary, but diving in, um, I'll never regret it. And I went against the advice I got. So I'm not really sure what you should, you know, listen to experts, but in the end, do what you feels right for you. Great, thanks. And uh, uh, next question uh, kind of builds on that or builds off of that a little bit. Um, one of our uh, participants is interested in starting their own business while they're in high school, um, or, or I guess um, possibly in university kind of thing. And there are some programs that um, um, help fund that, although I, I think for this year the deadline has passed, but you don't necessarily have to get financing. Um, but if, if you're in high school, uh, like many of our participants are right now, um, do you have any advice or suggestions on, on how somebody uh, test out whether they, they like running a business, whether they have a, an idea that's worth pursuing? Um, I know, I'll just say, sorry, Pandora. I just say that um, I really got a sense for how I enjoyed um, like that entrepreneurship and leadership element of it through a lot of volunteering. Um, like there were a lot of local charities that I, when I was a student and just starting out in marketing, worked with, and I got a sense for like that responsibility element of it, because there's a very different, um, it's a very different experience being an employee versus the owner, you know, you're the, the ham or the, what do they say, the eggs or the bacon in that situation, you're fully committed and you can't quit that job when you are the owner. So having that sense of responsibility by volunteering for different events and with different charities and organizations kind of gave me a taste of that. Um, if you're in high school now, like I know other people have mentioned different, like if you can do any sort of internships or work placements, I'm a huge advocate of those. Uh, my own internship was an amazing experience and it helped me to rule out what I liked as much as what I didn't like. So um, I will say there's a lot of entrepreneur resources like others mentioned, but also just being like the entrepreneurship capital of Canada as we are here. Um, there's other things like just starting super small with like a little store, you know, there's lots of different ways to be an entrepreneur from like an Etsy shop to, you know, a service like a consultant such as myself to having a large inventory and storefront like for all ice cream, which is very daunting to me. Um, but yeah, it's depends on what kind of entrepreneur you want to be. Um, yeah, just to kind of build on that. Um, so my daughter is not quite in high school yet. She's in grade six and she started her own business last year. Um, and it's a subscription box service for kids that love ponies because she's 11 and has her own pony. Um, and I was able to connect her in to other folks that, um, so like as a parent, I mean, you can go to your parents and say, hey, I want to do this. Do you know anybody that does this? Because chances are your parents probably have somebody in their network that might do what you want to do that you could learn from. Um, if you want to make things, you can start off by just going on Etsy and like making your own little Etsy account. I think you only have to be 16. If you're under the age of 16, you can have your parent or guardian make it. Um, or even selling on Facebook Marketplace. If you have access to Facebook Marketplace or if your parents are on Facebook, if you want to make stuff, there's lots of different ways that you can start. It just really depends on what you want to do. Um, like she said, um, with volunteerism, like volunteering at your local centers to see if like maybe you think that you want to, um, you know, start start something working with children. Like maybe you're in your final years of high school and you're thinking, oh, like I'd love to run a camp program. We need to volunteer at your local camp or a local summer camp, whether it's a church camp or um, a Waterloo region camp, something like that. Just kind of see if that's something that you like, something that you're passionate about. And then learning from the people who are there, building connections, building relationships and going off of that. The biggest thing you'll learn in entrepreneurship is it's all about networking, communicating and and who you know, um, like there's so many people around you that you might not think be able to help you or guide you that will end up surprising you. So first thing I would start with is just connecting with the adults in your life to see kind of maybe they know somebody that can help you along the way and give you that first little boost. And what I wanted to add was um, just maybe a little bit more on what one of the things Courtney had said was start, start small. Like for, we're five years in it for all, and it, it feels a lot bigger now. It, it is a lot bigger now than when I first started, but I started off tiny. Um, and you and you learn and you learn your craft that way. You learn what works and you learn what doesn't work. One of the things that Tyler had said was in starting small, you know, 
you, you'll make mistakes. Actually, you, however you start, you're going to make mistakes. So if you're kind of prepared for that, just, just take those little, those little tiny steps and every little step is a step closer. Um, and some of the steps might be forward, some of the steps might be backwards, but starting, but starting tiny, um, eventually you'll get, you'll get to, to something. Okay. Um, another question that uh, I thought was uh, quite interesting um, was uh, the, the, the big uh, <laughs> question uh, when running a business. How, how do you deal with finances? Um, and, and how do you find uh, the finances to support your ideas? Um, um, what kind of, I guess, barriers and struggles do you face in the finance department? Our face still. <laughs> um, I'll just jump in and quickly say I don't have too much to say on this. Um, I basically have zero overhead. I pay rent at my gym. That's about all uh, I have to, to worry about. Um, again, sole proprietorship. I don't have any employees or anything like that. So I don't have too much to say on this. Just Yeah, as someone who's also a service-based industry, um, like I have a certain amount of overhead as a digital marketer with the tools that I pay for, um, you know, website subscriptions, other things that other businesses would have as well. Um, but in terms of, you know, I don't have a brick and mortar, like a physical location to pay for. I don't have staff and a payroll. So it's very, uh, I saw it as in terms of an entrepreneurship risk. I saw it as like a much less brave risk than someone who's going in with inventory. Um, but um, yeah, so it's it's still a thing though, learning about cash flow and things like that. I definitely underestimated it. Um, uh, the agency I was a director of was, uh, you know, grossed like 3 million in revenue every year. So I thought like doing this as a one person operation is no problem, but I just, I really underestimated just taking into account, you know, your own vacation days. And if you're sick, nobody's working and nobody gets paid that day. Um, just different realities of being a human being when you want to work like 40 hours a day. <laughs> so um, just different things like that, that were like more reminders that we're all human, so. <laughs> I think for me, one of the things I had to learn about was cash flow, right? You got money coming in and you got money coming out. And so one of the things that, and I, I don't think I learned to do it off the bat, but one of the things that's helped me and continues to help me is just kind of planning what's coming in and what's coming out. And I don't always get it right. In fact, I most of the time get it wrong, the wrong way. Um, but when I was first, first starting, um, one of the things that, and, and, and it has to do with finances, is that there are a lot of programs that exist. And I just was like, let me apply to a lot of to some of these programs. So one program that was super helpful to me was one called Futurepreneur, and they specifically help young people. You have to be under 40 to, to, to get it in. I think I like got my application in like the day before I turned 40. I was like 39 and 356 days, but I squeezed in. Um, and I was able to get some money to help with my, with my business idea. But one of the things I liked about that application is that that application taught you, the, the whole process of doing the application was teaching you how to do a business plan and it's kind of nuts because like making that like you don't know what you're writing like if you're just you're typing stuff and you have ideas so just kind of thinking through a plan and a plan what I learned is that a plan doesn't have to be perfect in fact your plan will be wrong but plan and pay attention so that as you kind of move along your path and you, you can kind of self-correct and make and, and make adjustments and so I was able to set a business plan that on paper was, I, I mean, I, I went back to read it. It was, it, it, it was ridiculous, but it was a plan. I didn't know it was ridiculous at the time. It was, it was a plan, but like it, it was, it's through that. So anyway, I got funding through, some funding through um, Futurepreneur. What I also got from Futurepreneur, which was more valuable, is that I got a mentor. I got a mentor partner, somebody who didn't do anything close to what I wanted to do, however, new business. So all of a sudden I had a person that I could talk to about my plan. I was like, and a part of the things that I had to give in my plan. And so he kind of, that person helped me keep on track in terms of, well, this is your plan. Where are you now? So it was a component of, again, I got financing by applying for, for this program, which I got awarded. And it wasn't a grant. It was like, you're going to have to pay us back, but here's the money. And here's, a, here's somebody to help you like to, to, to plan. 
time. So I feel like, you know, planning, planning money, I guess money can come from almost anywhere. If you're able to, to start small enough that you don't need a lot of it, the key is, is planning. And it doesn't have to be right the first time. It's just that keeping track and paying attention so that you can adjust and react in as, as, as live as possible to, to that plan. For me, I was really lucky um, as an Indigenous person, there are a lot of grants and programs now that are coming up to help um, really promote Indigenous entrepreneurship. So um, like I mentioned, I'm Métis, the Métis Nation of Ontario, which is the Métis, I guess, organization or government that I belong to. I was able to get a grant and then get some funding through various programs that they offer to kind of start the business. And then I was also able to get into a program through Communitech which is a local agency here in Kitchener Waterloo called the Pierce Founders Program. Um, and they provided me with a $10,000 non-matching grant to help purchase um, materials and stuff like that that I would use to on um, the tech side of my business. And then I also got a mentor essentially like for life, like we've got a really good relationship now. So whenever I have questions and stuff, I bounce things off her, even though I'm still not in the program. Um, I'm gonna apply for their next program, which is like a step up where you have to have matching funds and they match the funds that you have. Um, so I'm looking forward to applying to that one next, but that's where I got the most help um, in terms of like finances and guidance was through their, uh, their Pierce Founders program. I'll, I'll just uh, throw in a few other uh, local programs that are relevant to our first question or our last question. Um, one is um, our friends at JA Southwestern Ontario. Um, one of the things they do is help to encourage youth entrepreneurship. So you can look into that. I know in particular, uh, I saw just the other day um, that they are they have a summer camp where they'll be helping, um, you know, people to kind of uh, youth, you know, I think even young youth um, kind of learn about running their own business. Um, certainly, I mean, if you're more into the, 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 the X side of things, uh, there are, um, this community is uh, built to uh, help uh, Startups, um, and that's where you would look at uh, Communitech in particular, um, and the Communitech Hub, uh, um, things like um, the Velocity Program, which is associated with uh, University of Waterloo. Laurie has um, it's it's I believe it's called it Garage Program, and and, and so there are um, and, and you know they they uh, at the hub, for instance, they do have um, advisors and so forth, and I'm. Um, some of that may seem like it's uh, um, above high school students, but if you have the right idea, um, it, it may not be. Um, or or uh, um, you're only uh, a, num a short number of years away from um, being in post-secondary and, uh, um, you know, uh, being eligible for these um, programs, especially if you have the that's the right idea and so forth. And there's another program that uh, BEP is, is launching soon that I'll, I'll mention at the end that, that could be helpful too. Um, that next question um, is, uh, we, we've heard a lot about uh, bumps, failures or <laughs> uh, challenges, that kind of thing. Um, somebody would like to know basically how how you got past those, um, how, uh, how you dealt with um, barriers and obstacles and, and, and those kinds of challenges. Um, and it might help uh, if you're willing to, uh, to, to, to share at least an example or give an idea of on uh, what the challenge was. Um, uh, yeah, because that's uh, definitely a part of running a business is uh, handling those ups and downs. Absolutely. Um, was kind of chomping at the bit to get to this question because actually a couple of the other questions I see, like, what are your regrets? Can you tell us some things that you had done differently? And I'm going to kind of try to answer all of this in one. Um, it requires a reframing of the way we think, like period. Life is perspective. It is what you make of it. Um, so uh, the, some of the <laughs> best things that I can suggest, I mean, we talked about cognitive behavioral therapy, also known as cognitive behavioral techniques that is challenging your uh, negative and false beliefs. So that's something I think everybody should look into. Again, I'm a huge fan of ancient Stoic philosophy. Uh, the word obstacles was in one of that question. One of my favorite quotes by Marcus Aurelius is uh, the impediment to action advances action, the obstacle, but stands in the way becomes the way. Um, the things 
that show up as challenges in your life, I look at them as lighthouses guiding me in the direction of the things that I have to face. As someone who dealt with terrible anxiety, if I get anxious about something, that is a sign that that's something I have to conquer. And the more that you run away from things, the more that those things are going to just grow and grow and grow until you confront them. And I promise you, you will have to confront them. No, uh, there's another quote I like by Ryan Holiday. I've got some books here. I just want to quickly mention, um, uh, stop looking for angels and start looking for angles. No one's coming to save us, especially again, it's entrepreneur world or just life in general. Like the, the more we blame other people for things, the more we're giving away our power. Um, we have the power to accomplish anything. Um, you know, the question about like, uh, can we start a, a business in high school? Like 110% you can, like, if you have the passion, you know, anything is possible. So just really quickly, um, again, it all comes down to, to shifting mindset. Like this is kind of really what I want to get across and what I want to get into in public speaking is like, it's all well and good to get the diet in order and the, and the exercise and the whatever. But like, if you don't fix what's going on up here, like, you're just kind of screwed. So just some top books that I recommend to clients and lend out to friends and family and stuff. I think reading is number one. Like I can't think of a better way to distill sometimes entire lives of people or just fantastic ideas into short, you know, uh, ways of learning. It doesn't have to be books, it can be audiobooks, podcasts, surround yourself, steep yourself in the understanding that mis I don't believe in mistakes. I don't have regrets. Like all of, I am, happy and and proud of the things that i've overcome and i can tell you in the depths of my despair and depression and anxiety i would have never thought that i would be for having gone through that but it has made me a more empathetic and compassionate and understanding person and that is it allowed me to find my career so really quickly uh mindset by carol dweck to talk about growth mindset versus a fixed mindset a lot of people think that they're just born certain ways and they're not good at math they're not good at english they can't do this you're, you're not born a genius. I don't believe that put in the 10,000 hours. Um, and you can kind of get anywhere and learn anything, accomplish anything tribe of mentors. We talked a lot about mentors, Tim Ferriss. This is an example of like maybe a hundred different, um, mentors that kind of share like insights, uh, courage is calling everything that you want is on the other side of fear. Like I said, I use my anxiety as a lighthouse. The scary things in life are what we need to overcome. And like, usually like nothing good ever comes easy. Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl, uh, is a, was an Auschwitz survivor and like just explains, uh, and also a psychologist and kind of explains like his techniques and stuff for like dealing with, you know, one of the most unimaginably horrible things. I mentioned Ryan Holiday quickly. I don't have his first book, Obstacle is the Way. Uh, that's, I lent that to my mom, but like ego is the enemy. The biggest thing standing in your way is yourself and you can overcome that. Definitely stillness is the key. We spend way too much time, like just inundated with social media and dings and pings. And we don't spend enough time just like confronting our thoughts. And I think that's, again, something that we have to confront. And then lastly, I won't read the title, but you'll get an idea. It's bleeped out. But like, this is the book that I started with. This is the book that I recommend to everybody because the th biggest thing holding you back, holding us all back is our fear of what other people think about us. Okay. I mentioned dropping out of college. Uh, I, I took, took a lot of flack from my family, switching jobs, blah, 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 this and that. And like, people are worried about their own stuff, man. Like, just worry about you, do your thing, uh, bring your light into the world. And uh, yeah, that's just kind of what I want to get across. Thanks. Anyone else uh, with a, uh, with a major challenge or obstacle uh, that they managed to get past? How did you do that? Um, if I can just uh, quickly share, it's um, the job that I held in between the marketing agency. Um, I left my job as director and started uh, working what we call in-house directly for a company as their director. And um, I had this kind of like new age marketing plan. They were very um, old school and some online marketing tactics that are kind of seen as more spammy tactics today. And I came in wanting to update everything. And um, after like nine months or so of trying to update everything, the senior team and like the owners were just pushing too hard against it, decided they didn't want to go that direction anymore. And so they laid me off um, with no notice. So as someone who had, you know, had a lot of confidence and had built myself up a lot at this point in my career, um, it was like a huge blow. Um, you know, all the other marketers I spoke to, you know, usually were like, that's insane. You're a really good marketer. And so it was like, 
just very odd and difficult to deal with because um, I knew I could have helped them and was just kind of like, but, but, um, and at that point I realized that like that was out of my control and that in order to like control that relationship with the people I worked with and to work directly with business owners and control the success that they have through me, like in their marketing, that's why I was like, nope, I'm going to call the shots and I'm going to start my own business. So that is, um, that is like how I started it and how I made the decision. And that's also, um, you know, I was unemployed. So I just dove in and it made it slightly easier. I wasn't leaving another job, um, but it's basically that failure, so to speak, being laid off turned into my own business, which three years later, I definitely don't regret. I get to help business owners every day, so. For me, um, I think that my biggest failure since starting my business is um, my time management skills. Um, we have a very full, very, very busy house with four children and then we're due with our fifth pretty soon. Um, I've dropped some deadlines and missed some deadlines on stuff and then I've had to stay up all night, <laughs> like literally 24 hours, getting, um, getting an order finished to ship out the next morning type thing. Um, I've had to call in my mom to help me a few times with something like that and, and friends. Um, so yeah, like the biggest thing I, I struggle with, I know I struggle with and that I continue to struggle with and work on is understanding how long a job takes. So when we make stuff, we make stuff from start to finish. We get the wood, we design the design for the wood, we engrave it and we bring it home because um, our store has our laser and all of our materials, but then our home, we purchased a home that has a 18th century barn um, and we have a little wood shop in there. So we engrave here, go to blocks, go home, sand it, bring it back here and package it. Um, so just understanding how long that takes and understanding that there's even time in between, like I put something in the laser, it beeps, it's done. I go over and take it out. Like that could be two to three minutes if I'm picking up all these little pieces. So just the time management and understanding how long something takes. I think that's a big thing in any type of business where you're working with your hands, like especially with woodworking and and anything like that, any of those trades type um, entrepreneurships that you're looking at starting, understanding how long something takes from start to finish, and then keeping a log of that. Um, so now, like I've got a little notebook on my desk and it says this puzzle takes 12 minutes in the laser, two to three minutes to switch over, five minutes to package five of them. So being able to start documenting that. So I understand when I'm quoting a job, oh, it's two to three weeks. Well, really, it's going to take me three to six weeks because of all of these steps that I'm missing. That's my biggest struggle and something I'm working on every single day. If, if there's time I can share um, kind of, it was an early failure for me. Um, so I just signed my first lease. Like I, you know, I, I, I started off renting a, like a bench in a commissary kitchen, figured out how to make ice cream and, you know, got, got, got far enough along to sign a lease to a space that I was going to make ice cream in. Um, I'd already talked to public health. I had all my approvals. I was set to go only to come across an article about a small batch ice cream company in Guelph that had recently just been shut down by the Ontario government because everything they were doing was illegal. And I was looking at what they're doing. I was looking at what I was doing. And I was like, I'm doing the exact same thing they are. And I have, you know, the, 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 I've got my public health approval. I'm good to go. But in that moment, just kind of realizing that there was another set of criteria that I wasn't aware of. And frankly, the people that had inspected and approved me weren't aware of. And so for me, instead of, you know, I, I guess I could, I mean, I, I cried and then I was like, okay, like, so now I've got a choice. I either want to keep going or this is, this is as far as I get. So it was making that choice that, okay, I want to keep on going. And instead of kind of, you know, being mad at public health for, I can't believe you approved me. I can't believe you didn't know. Like for me, it was like, okay, I guess they didn't know either. So in that moment, I had to make the choice of keep keep going. Well, I mean, I had to make a choice, keep going or stop. And so once I decided I was going to keep going, um, it was relearning everything I thought I knew and kind of starting all over. Um, so the lesson for me there was really like whenever you have those obstacles, whatever they are, you've got to make a choice. Is this the one that finishes you? Or do you keep going? And if you choose to keep going, then don't like, for, you know, put, you have to put it behind you and keep moving forward. That was, that, that, that was kind of my first stumble, first major stumble. And first time that for me, I learned that these are all going to, these are going to come up time and time again. And every single time they come up, I've got to choose, is this the end? And if it's not, then you, you kind of shut up about it and keep, and keep going. 
That's yeah. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, uh, I know one obstacle I faced uh, um, was was finding for all ice cream the very first time I went there <laughs> in your original location, uh, uh, even though I knew the building. <laughs> but it was worth it absolutely once once I got there. So um, much easier to find these days. Uh, um, Waterloo, where is this so called Waterloo Town Square? Waterloo, okay, anyway. Um, we have run out of time. I, I see there are a few more questions, um, um, but uh, unfortunately we have run out of time for tonight. But I, there's a few things I'd like to um, quickly say before we sign off. Um, one is that you can find out more um, about uh, Pandora's business um, and some other local businesses on uh, a website that is especially for um, for youth and all high school students um, across Waterloo Region have access to it. It's called Edge Factor. Um, and if you go uh, to edgefactor.com slash Waterloo ON, um, that's a special hub page for this area. And it has um, uh, Pandora's videos. It has videos from uh, uh, Lena Shamoon, who's a, um, a hairstylist who is uh, part of our Speakers Bureau and, and some other local companies as well. So um, we uh, uh, we have a fifth panelist with us. Uh, <laughs> oh, six. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> <laughs> There'll be seven before we know. <laughs> Anyhow, um, the uh, program that BEP is uh, is launching, we're kind of in a pilot phase right now, um, just for, for Schism students. Um, in the fall, we'll open it up to uh, anybody from grade five to grade 10, called the, the Youth Creativity Fund. Um, and that will give uh, um, up to $1,000 uh, for you to uh, identify a problem and, and apply your creativity towards solving it. Um, it's uh, a program we're running in collaboration with the Creative Capital of Canada um, and uh, um, our local developer, uh, um, Scott Higgins from Hip Development. Um, right now, we're, we're just eliminating it to Schism students because uh, we kind of want to, uh, <laughs> being a new program, we want to kind of pilot it and make sure that um, we work out all the, the kinks and the processes so that when we open up, up wider in the fall, um, we're, we're all ready to go. So that um, is youthcreativityfund.ca. Um, and we have sent uh, information directly to all Chisholm students. I know there may be a few here now. Um, this is our last uh, Explore Your Future for 2021-22. Uh, um, we know that there's a lot of other things to be doing in June in particular. Um, we look forward to seeing you back in the fall, we are planning to have um, more of these virtual panel discussions, but we're also uh, uh, COVID willing, uh, planning to have a couple uh, in-person uh, career expos, um, just like we, we used to have. Um, one in the fall we're expecting to have would be um, focused mainly on um, skilled trades uh, and, and how you uh, can get apprenticeships and the jobs and all that kind of stuff, and then we're um, we'll have a, an even bigger, broader one um, in the spring, um, looking at basically just a, a, every, uh, uh, we'll have um, universities, colleges, uh, nonprofits, um, businesses, all kinds of folks so that you can look at your career options, um, hopefully set some goals and figure out how to get there. Um, and in the meantime, uh, there is lots of good resources at BEPWR.ca. We have career profiles there um, where we have uh, almost 200 people who have shared their job descriptions and how they got there. We have um, links to resources such as uh, Edge Factor. Um, uh, and we also have um, uh, uh, lots of videos on our YouTube channel, including many of our past Explore Your Future sessions. So, Thank you all for joining us tonight. Um, thank you for uh, joining us in the past year. Uh, thank you very much um, to the panel. Um, one more great thank you to our, our sponsors who make this all possible. And uh, take care, have a good night.